A few weeks ago, I was helping a friend of mine out, doing some work he needed to have done. And we were talking about different things. And he came up with the Carrington event. That's a Carrington event? What is that? Oh, Harry, I got one on you. You've never heard of the Carrington event? Said, no. Well, there's a lot of things I haven't heard of. He said it happened in 1859. Well, there's not a lot in the 1800s that I didn't know about. But the Carrington event was new to me. It might be new to you. So what is the Carrington event? Oh, that's when EMPs hit the earth, electromagnetic pulses hit the earth and took out the electrical grid. Took out all everybody's uh, uh, telegraphs and, and this and that. And, oh, okay. Well, there wasn't a whole lot of electrical grid back then. And, and this started, uh, he started telling me that the, uh, the telegraphs were wiped out, that the, the telegraph ticker paper started catching on fire. And that people were getting shocked. It's pretty much the same thing as what you see online everywhere. Hmm. Okay. Well, I've been working with high voltage electricity, AC and DC, most of my life. And I know that DC current doesn't get disrupted. It's a closed system. And, and I just don't see. I'm, I'm, and that was my first uh, issue with it was, how in the world is anything going to take out telegraph unless the wire is cut? I just don't understand it. I just don't see it, even today. And neither do my other DC expert friends. And they'd never heard of the Carrington event either. Well, when I was growing up, living at home, my father he subscribed to Science Digest, Omni Magazine. How many people out there remember Omni Magazine? Uh, Discover Magazine, uh, Popular Mechanics, Popular Science, Astronomy Magazine. And I read all these issues from the 70s up to the, uh, uh, the early 80s. And I'd never seen the Carrington event mentioned in anything. Hmm. Well, here we have the 1990 edition, 15th edition, of the Encyclopedia Britannica, published in Chicago, 1990. Handsome set of books here, handsome, handsome. There's like 33 volumes. There's even a volume on how to use it. <laughs> and uh, Carrington event is not mentioned in 1990, Britannica. And this is the last edition of Britannica, which I'm, I may show a little bit more about the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. This is the last. But Carrington is mentioned. He's in here, he's all over the place. In the 1800s, we're gonna look at some encyclopedia sets. And we're going to look at some of Carrington's work. And generally speaking, uh, the people that start out their videos, they'll go, uh, Carrington was an amateur astronomer. An amateur astronomer. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. And going forward, the online Encyclopedia Britannica, which is available to anyone, the Carrington event was added to the online uh, uh, Britannica in 2010. Well, by then, the internet was well established, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. But how come it took so late for the, the, the Carrington event to get into Encyclopedia Britannica, 2010? So we're gonna look at some information and we're gonna, we're gonna uh, uh, see when and how the Carrington event took place. Thank you. We're going to jump right in now to the new Encyclopedia Britannica from Volume 2, printed in 1990 in Chicago. This is the 15th and last edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. And we're going to jump to Volume 2, page 900, where we find under the heading of Richard Christopher Carrington, born in 1826, died 1875, English astronomer who by observing the motions of the sunspots discovered the equatorial acceleration of the sun. For example, or for instance, that it rotates faster at the equator than near the poles. He also discovered the movement of sunspot zones toward the sun's equator as the solar cycle progresses. The son of a brewer, get this, Carrington was educated at Cambridge and in 1853 established his own observatory at Red Hill in Surrey. He published a catalog of 3,700 plus uh, stars in 1857, but in 1865 his health failed and he did little work thereafter. He was educated at Cambridge and owned his own observatory. Yet today he is considered an amateur. Okay, moving forward. We're going to look at a caption here 
under sunspots from volume 11 page 398 we're looking at more Carrington's work here by observing sunspots R.C. Carrington found around 1860 that the Sun rotates not as a solid body but differentially fastest at the equator sunspots are never seen exactly at the equator or near the poles so this is Carrington's discoveries that are that still hold firm today he was the person who discovered them he monitored the sunspots all day every day he looked at him he had a he had a, a little screen uh, probably looked like a, a little bit larger than an iPhone today uh, and that's what he stared at all day long okay this comes from volume 28 page 487 under the heading of telecommunications or telegraph and we're going to pick up right here Morris's who from Morris code Morris's register was modified from an embosser to an inker using inked felt to moisten a tiny recording wheel affixed to the moving armature now get this the inker in turn was replaced by the exceedingly simpler sounder around 1856 after operators had developed the skill to write down what they heard the register say as accurately and even more quickly than they could transcribe it on a blank sheet of paper what the register wrote okay so by 1856 the the paper tickers had already become obsolete I find this last I want to jump down here and read this sentence here I find this interesting the typewriter was adapted to telegraph office use soon after the introduction in 1878 of key shift type bar models. What does that tell you? It tells you by 1878 they had email. Ain't that something? But you didn't know that, did you? Next, I'm going to show you page 561 from volume 21 out of 1929 14th edition Britannica under the topic of Sun and we're going to pick up here within each of these regions RC Carrington found as the result of a large number of observations that the mean rotation period of the Sun was 25.38 days while near the equator the period was only 24.5 days Individual sunspots appear spasmodically, remain visible for periods varying from a few days to several months, and then disappear. This is Carrington. Next, we're going to look at a caption from volume 21, same issue, 14th edition, page 890, under the heading of Telegraph. Interference. Telegraph operation is more or less affected by parasitic currents from various outside sources. These sources include earth potentials arising from natural causes, see magnetism, and there is nothing under magnetism that is concerned with the telegraph. But th there does have some magnetic issues, which I'm going to explain here in a second. Number two, earth potentials arising from electric railway systems. Number three, induction from one telegraph circuit to another. And four, induction from electric railway or power supply systems. And I would say number five could be having a cable cut. And cables did go down with storms, uh, high winds or ice or something like that. When a cable broke, you did not have any uh, uh, telegraph capabilities. And concerning magnetism, the only thing I could find how magnets affect uh, the telegraph systems of old was if you had a, a magnet that was too close to the ticker uh, or to the, uh, the the element of send and receive it would lock up the solenoid and it would just pull the uh, the um, uh, I guess the little contact it would pull the contact over and you would not be able to send or receive that's all I could find concerning magnetism but here do we see anything concerning solar flares and this is 1929 next we're going to take another step backwards I was busted 25 years ago or more uh, I was accused of working backwards and and I stuck with it 
I figure it's a mantra and and it's it's a uh, uh, a trademark I can deal with. This is the Encyclopedia Britannica from 1910. This is the 11th edition front cover of the outside jacket. Just beautiful set of books. Beautiful set of books. And we're going to go here to uh, 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 volume 5 under page 408. Richard Carrington. Born in 26, died in 75. Though intended for the church, his studies and tastes inclined him to astronomy. And with a view to gaining experience in the routine of an observatory, he accepted the post of observer in the University of Durham, finding, however, that there was little chance of obtaining instruments suitable for the work which he had wished to undertake. He resigned that appointment and established in 1853 an observatory of his own at Red Hill. Here he devoted three years to a survey of the zone of the heavens within nine degrees of the North Pole, and the result was his uh, catalog of 3,735 stars. But his name is chiefly perpetuated through his investigation of the motions of sunspots, by which he determined the elements of the sun's rotation and made the important discovery of a systematic drift of the, the photosphere, causing the rotation periods of spots to lengthen with increase of solar latitude. He died in November of 1875. Now I'm going to go back here. But his name is chiefly perpetuated through his investigation of the motions of sunspots, well, I thought his name was chiefly perpetuated with the event he discovered. Okay, in 1859. 1859. Next, I'm going to show you the uh, title page of uh, Volume 2 from the same set of books, the Encyclopedia Britannica, Dictionary of Arts, Literature, and General Inflammation, 11th edition, Volume 2. This is under astronomy. There's the little logo there, which means those who, uh, those who come here get knowledge. And there we have it right there, Cambridge, England, at the University Press, and this one is New York, 1910. There it is. And page 816 of volume 2, we're going to start right here. An argument for the aboriginal connection of comets with the solar system founded by R.C. Carrington in 1860 upon their participation in its translatory movement was more fully developed by Fabry in 1893 and the close orbital relationships of cometary groups actuated by the pursuit of each other along nearly the same track by the comets of 1843, 1880, and 82 singularly illustrated the probable vicissitudes of their careers. The most remarkable event, however, in the recent history of cometary astronomy was its assimilation to that of meteors, which took unquestionable cosmic rank uh, as, a con uh, as a consequential uh, result of the Leonid Tempest of November of 1833. So here we've got all these dates jumping all around 1859, don't we? And here we have Carrington, and this is in 1910, and where is the care? I'm just asking. We're going to go farther back here in just a moment. Just stay with me. Now this comes from volume 26 of the same set, 11th edition, page 80. And down here we have where he closed his observatory. Mr. R.C. Carrington's observatory at Red Hill, established in 1854. And these, this is the equipment that he had with the ladder, a catalog positions of 3,735 stars within 9 degrees of the pole with the former regular observ uh, observations of sunspots were made from 1853 to 1861. Well, I'm going to let you ask that question. I'm going to let you ask that question. Now, let's go back to the year 1899, my uh, dictionary of names and places. Richard Christopher Carrington, born in Chelsea, 1826, died uh, 1875, an English astronomer there's the absence of the word amateur there, isn't there? Yeah. He was noted for his observations of the minor planets, fixed stars, and the sun, made chiefly at his private observatory at Red Hill in Surrey. This guy was legit, and he was out there, and he was good, and he was no amateur. Let's go, let's go look at some more. Next, we're going to go back another 30-plus years or so. 
from American Cyclopedia, 1879, second edition revised, volume 15. And this is under the heading of solar. Here you see New York, 1879. And we're going to look at page 471. And we're going to start right here. The following elements of the sun's rotation belong to the astronomy of recent times, having been deduced from results obtained by Carrington and Spohr reduced to the year 1869. And here you see Carrington's observations and Spohr's observations. It will be perceived that a mean rotation is indicated. Carrington's observations have shown that spots in different solar latitudes travel at different rates. And then we're going to scroll down here a little bit. I'm not going to read it all, but I will scroll it so you can read it if you want to. Carrington gives the following formula for the rotation in different solar latitudes. And here's his formulas. Now we're going to jump over to page 473. This account would be incomplete without a description of the remarkable solar explosion actually witnessed by Professor Young on September the 7th of 1871. Oh, where's, where's, where's my Carrington event of 1859? The remarkable solar explosion of 1871. Well, there, I'm just saying figure one represents a cloud prominence he had been observing on the eastern limb of the sun. It was, get this, about 100,000 miles long and 54,000 miles high. He was called away. Let's see what happened. He was called away at 1230 and on returning at 1255 found that the whole thing had been literally blown to shreds. And this is his picture of what it looked like when he, when he was watching it. And then we see the next picture down here of what it looked like a little over half an hour later. He drew this. Wow. Boy, was that some explosion or what? Now we're going back up here because this is the main thing I want to show you here. This is shown in figure three, which we're going to look at. On the left side, the results of Carrington's observations of 1,414 spots between 1853 and 1861 and are indicated. And on the right, the result of Sexty's observations of 2,767 protuberances in 1871. The number of spots or prominences being indicated, of course, shown by the length of the radial lines. Now, Let's go down and look at figure three. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Isn't that beautiful? All right, on the left here is Carrington's work showing 1,414 uh, uh, and 14 spots. And he shows them in these latitudes here. And, and here's, here's the equator of the sun. And here's the number here. And these are just brilliant. And here are the protuberances of Secchi's. And what you could actually do is flip these on top of each other and even get a better idea of the activity of the sun there. Let you study that for a moment there. In 1879 some of these guys were sharp on their toes. Now we're going to jump over to uh, uh, volume, uh, same volume 15 page 618 under telegraph and there's a lot recorded in these old books concerning telegraph and the disturbances and the influences that and 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 interferences we're going to pick up right here down at the bottom of this column the failure of other deep sea cables as that between Sardinia, Malta, and Corfu and the long cable from the Red Sea to India increased the distrust let's go back up to the top of the page here increase the distrust occasioned by the failure of the Atlantic Cable of 1858. So we have a, a failure in the telegraph system uh, where a line went down and it is recorded in these old uh, encyclopedia sets as well as there are others. 
and I'm just going to scroll down a little bit there in case somebody wants to see that and read it. It's quite interesting. I'm sorry that the inside of this is blurred, but that's what you have with these old books. They're just so doggone hard to push open for the scanner. Some of them are very, very tough. They were made to last. You know, I'm just wondering if anyone can show anything that the Carrington event existed before 1990. Shouldn't be that hard. How about Astronomy Magazine, Science Digest, Popular Science. I believe there's also a magazine, Stars, from, uh, from the 70s and 80s. Is the Carrington event mentioned in any of them? Not that I can remember. We showed that by 1856, the telegraph systems had already gone to, they'd already gotten away from the, uh, the ticker tapes. So all the rest of the newspaper reports, alleged newspaper reports, they were all about the Aurora Borealis. Nothing about the telegraph. The rest of it's all made up. Can nobody prove that it happened? That's all I'm saying. So how could the Earth be bombarded with solar flares and EMPs in the first place? Because we are protected by the Van Allen Belt. That's right, the Van Allen Belt protects the Earth from solar flares, radiation. It's a radiation belt. And I'm sure many of you have heard about the Van Allen Belt, discovered in, what, 1958 uh, uh, from um, Geiger counters, World War II Geiger counters that were attached to the side of Explorer 1. And the Explorer 1 went through the radiation belt. And, and how did that missile, how did that satellite, that space probe, how did it radio back the, that, the information that they gained to deduce that there was a Van Allen belt if radio waves can't go through it? Now, we have from the moon, there was video that went through the Van Allen belt. We have radio waves that went through. And they say that the Van Allen belt is impenetrable. Nothing can get through it. Nothing can get through it. But for millions of years, I would suppose that meteor, meteors have been getting through the Van Allen Belt just fine, haven't they? And if you look online, they have all these nice graphic pictures, uh, uh, like the Earth down inside a donut. And the Van Allen Belt radiation is strongest over the equator. That's right, over the equator. Well, there might be a couple of problems with that. Now, the... Uh, 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 the lunar landing conspiracists, they base a lot of their information on the existence of a Van Allen belt. That nothing can get through it, and that proves for a fact that there were no lunar landings. And on the other hand, the flat earthers, they use the Van Allen belt as uh, a, a, uh, um, a, for instance, for lack of a better word, as, as proving that the earth is flat because there's a firmament. And for the flat earthers, I'd just like to see a picture of underneath uh, all this conglomerate that you call a flat earth. I'd like to see a picture from underneath it. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. And so, so given that, one of the things I do is I install satellite internet for people that live out in the middle of nowhere. And the Van Allen Belt, there's two of them. There's one that starts at like 1,200 miles above the surface of the Earth that goes for like 1,600 miles. But the second one ends at supposedly 12,400 miles above the Earth's surface. Well, these satellites that I lock into for Internet, they are all stationed right over the equator at 11,200 miles in geosynchronous orbit. Right smack in the middle of the second Van Allen belt. Well, how is that possible? Nothing can get through it. How, why aren't these uh, uh, satellites uh, just burning up? Well, with the existence of the Van Allen Belt, how could any solar flares get through it anyway? I'm just asking. I'm just asking. Now, there might be many of you who remember back in the 80s, the ozone hole. The ozone hole that opened up over Antarctica 
or, or even uh, North Pole or wherever, these, these ozone hole, the ozone hole, the sky is falling, Earth is doomed, the ozone hole, it, oh, all this radiation is going to get inside and it's just going to burn us up. Oh, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Well, what happened to the ozone hole? The ozone hole just mysteriously closed up and it was like a year later after it vanished that global warming came about. The sky is falling. Global warming. Well, global warming really didn't make it out of the uh, out of the chute, so then they changed it to climate change. Climate change. And climate change has pretty much run its course. It, uh, uh, it's just another one that's uh, based on pseudo-facts, pseudo-science, and there's no proof of it whatsoever. And But you can believe what you want. You can believe what you want. But my next issue is the Carrington event is going to be the next chicken little. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. The sun is going to burn us up. Solar energy is going to just come right at us. Come right at us. That's what's going to happen. So I guess you could say that's another one of my predictions. I predict that solar flares and the, and the, uh, 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 the Carrington event, even though nobody can show me anything. I, I doubt very seriously if anybody can show me anything before 2000, much less 1990, that has Carrington event on it. Certainly can't find it in the 1800s or 1900s. So how did it make the jump past World War II? How does the Carrington event jump over everything and then just all of a sudden become a, a sensation on the internet? So that's my prediction, is that the Carrington event will be the next sky is falling. And I'm going to show you at the end of this how one of my predictions came true, a printed prediction. And at the end of all this, I'm going to have an encore for the hardcore. So beware of that. You might, you might appreciate that. I know some of you will, and then some others won't. That's, that's okay. That's fine. That's fine. But let's get back to the Van Allen belt for a moment. Been around since 1958. Has anyone ever seen the Van Allen belt? No, I can't see it with my telescope. Can you see it? Have you seen it? No. Has anyone ever taken a picture of the Van Allen belt? No, but oh, there's so many convincing CGI and graphic images on the internet with the Van Allen belt. And I'm sure that, that college uh, science books are just filled with all these, all these nice color photographs of the Van Allen belt. Has anyone ever touched the Van Allen belt? No, no one's ever touched it. Well, and you see all these facts, and everybody relies on the Van Allen belt, and even the people who are really up on their snuff with the Van Allen belt, they have their own questions about the, the uh, literature that's put out. And I've, I've spoken to uh, uh, several of my friends lately that have been following, because three, four weeks ago, I never gave the Van Allen belt one question whatsoever. But now, I do question it. I'm going to call the Van Allen belt a pseudo belt. That's right. That's right. Until somebody can take a picture of it or show anything instead of these all these graphics. And why are my satellites right in it and they work fine? When I set up a, a, a satellite computer system, excuse me, satellite internet system, I hone in on that satellite to within a thousandth of an inch or less, maybe a ten thousandth of an inch. And there's no, there's no interference or anything. It works just fine, sitting smack in the middle of the second Van Allen belt. How's that happen? So, so how does the Van Allen belt work with all these satellites? How can you have both at the same time? Radio frequencies, video, on and on and on, and the meteor's coming through it. How do you have both at the same time? It's like with me, ge the geologists. I love playing with geologists. And, and, and I'll say, you know, well, two tonic plates. Now, I've never met a geologist that has read half the books on geology that, that I have. They, they're, they're not readers. They don't even study their own stuff. They get their degree through college, whatever, and that's it. Boom. They know it all. But then I'll point something out. Oh, oh, and then they start backstroking. But the geologists, for instance, how do you have both tectonic plates and continental drift with the Pangaea theory uh, that all the land was together, Gondwana. 
Okay, how do you have both at the same time when the oceans are the plates? Oh, oh they, these uh, continents just split apart and they just fill up with water in there and make a new plate. There's a lot of crap you have to believe. And then I had one geologist, he started backstroking. Well, and this is, what, this is what his reference was. Well, you can see it on the History Channel. Oh, oh, yeah, he's using the History Channel as a reference. That ain't going to work here. That ain't going to work here. The History Channel, Discover, uh, 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 TLC, National Geographic Channel, they're all just a bunch of bunk. Nothing but propaganda just to dumb people down. That's it. That's it. I know. I've been on the History Channel. I know how they set everything up, and then they, and then they put their own slant to it. That's just what they do. So what, you may ask, am I attempting to do? Uh, uh, one of the people who helped me with this said, how do you prove something didn't happen, Harry? How do you prove that it didn't happen? Well, you prove it by showing all the information and the fact that it doesn't, it doesn't exist in that information, but everything else does. If we have so many uh, uh, telegraph interferences and outages recorded through the 1800s and early 1900s, why isn't the Carrington event there? Why aren't solar flares in there? How in the world are you going to how in the world are you going to do that without cutting the line? I don't know. I don't know. So I am going to step out and say that the Carrington event is a pseudo event that it never happened and I'm going to predict that it never will happen. But it's possible that the powers that be could just wipe out all cell phones, electricity, internet, everything in an area and blame it on the sun. And how would you know? How would you know any different? How would you know? Oh, you're going to Google it and go online? Now, one of the things you can see online and in the encyclopedia sets concerning the Van Allen Belt is that it's empirical. It's all empirical. Well, has NASA shot us a line before? I guess you could say they have. I have to borrow a quote from Alex Collier, something he said back in 1996. NASA means no answers still available. I like that. There's all kinds of uh, uh, metaphors for NASA, but I like that one best. No answers still available. And it's all empirical. It's empirical. The Van Allen Belt's empirical. Well, you might could say the same thing about the Carrington event. <laughs> but uh, definitions of words have changed through the years. And to find out what empirical means, we're going to go back to my Noah Webster's uh, first edition from 1831, my oldest dictionary. We're going to see what that says about empirical. It's not a commonly used word. And if you Google it online, it doesn't say what the old dictionaries say. But I've got several dictionaries from the 1800s, but we're going to look at this one. Now, in studying uh, the, the, the Carrington event, you will see some uh, scholars that are on their toes uh, uh, say that the, the evidence is empirical, and I agree, it's empirical. But uh, what does that actually mean? Well, let's go back to 1831 and see what Noah Webster has here. Empiric, empirical pertaining to experiments or experience. First in experiments, as an empiric alchemist, yeah, known only by experience, derived from experiment, used and applied without science, as empiric skill. Empirically, as an adverb, by experiment, according to experience, without science, in the manner of quacks. It is quackery. Thank you for staying with me. And as I promised, I was gonna, I'm going to show you a prediction that I made uh, back in spring of 1980. Let's have a look at that prediction, shall we? Let's have a look at it. Now I'm going to jump sideways for just a moment. This was an article written about me in spring of 1980. Bright musician runs recording studio by night. By name, Brian Hubbard is a 21-year-old motor rebuilder in the Brighton plant. That shows you and proves that I was already rebuilding and building high-voltage electric motors 
by the time I was 21. And I'm just going to scroll this down. This shows how I got the nickname Horatio. See, Harry comes out of Horatio. Harry came, oh, about, you know, several years after this. And then I'm going to show this paragraph right here in the middle. I'm going to blow it up a little bit. One area I'm really excited about is three-dimensional recording. It not only lets the listener hear the music from the speakers, but throws the sound all around. Hopefully, it won't be too long before the consumer can buy albums recorded in three dimensions, he said. And there I'm predicting, uh, basically, three-dimensional sound, which later became surround sound, uh, put out, uh, invented by Dolby Laboratories. Dolby Labs came out with it, I believe, in, in like 1991 or 92. And by the mid-90s, a lot of uh, your theaters had uh, Dolby surround sound. And I'm going to scroll over here, let you see the kid. All that hair. This is my first control room, and I'm 21 years old. And my monitors, you can't see them up here on the wall, were JBL 4311Bs. And unfortunately, there are no engineers today that will be able to ever mix with these monitors but can you imagine just mixing for hours with no ear fatigue none zero now I'm gonna throw this out there here I am 21 years old and electric motor high voltage uh, uh, seasoned vet and a recording engineer at 21 what are 21 year olds today doing uh, one of my so see, it's asked me, he goes, well, why would, why would put somebody put something out like that on the Internet? Well, if you dig a little bit further down, you'll see that scientists are scared to death of, the, of, an, of another Carrington event. They're scared to death. And as much information as we have on the, uh, on the solar uh, flares and all of the disturbances from the early 1850s and the early 1860s through the 1860s and 1870s, well, where's the Carrington event at? Where's any disturbance from 1859 recorded? Even before the year 1990, it's not that hard to go back before 1990, but that's well before the internet. That's all I'm asking. Who can show anything about the, uh, the, the Carrington event in print in 1990? I, I, I can't, American Science Journal, uh, 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 American Society of, uh, of Astronomy, um, uh, so uh, American Astronomical Society, whatever the name of it is, I can't find anything. And I'd read all these magazines through the 80s, through the 70s, even uh, uh, popular mechanics all the way th down to the 60s. My father subscribed to them in the 50s. Where is it at? But I'm calling it a pseudo event until somebody can come up with anything different. Hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you. So that concludes my take on the pseudo Carrington event. I'm wide open. Hey, if you can crush me, do a video. Don't put some silly link down there. That ain't going to work. Cut a video. Show your information. Show your data. Prove that there was ever a Carrington event in, eight, in September of 1859. And I'll, 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 I'll video a retraction. I will video a retraction and say, hey, I got that one wrong. I got that one wrong. I can't be perfect all the time. Or can I? So, now... I want to tell you a little story concerning one of my friends up in uh, Connecticut. He had gotten into trouble back in 1994, I believe it was, and he was sentenced to do some community service. And his community service, he was supposed to show up at one of the Yale, uh, uh, univer Yale University book repositories or depositories. And when he got there, there was a dumpster out back, lined up in the parking lot there. And he said to him and a couple of other guys spent all day carting boxes of books out of the depository and throwing them into that dumpster. He said they're all nice, beautiful, gold gilded stamping leather books, old books. Got that old book smell. I love that old book smell. And they're throwing them all day long into that hopper and they filled that dumpster up. And that's what happens to these old books. Everybody's just throwing them under the bus, except me.
And there's a few others out there too that can actually prove something they're trying to say. So now let's go back inside and finish this encore for the hardcore with a eulogy to a dear old friend of mine. Thank you. Now my encore for the hardcore is truly a eulogy for an old friend. Now this is in the front page, the second title sheet of the 15th edition 1990 of Encyclopedia Britannica. And here we record the first, second, third, there's a supplement, fourth, fifth, sixth, Supplement 7th edition, 8th edition, 9th edition. 9th edition is just beautiful. I'd love to have one. Somebody wants to buy me a 9th edition Britannica. But I've enjoyed these books. I've enjoyed these encyclopedia sets so much. I, I've collected them through the years and just found them to be wonderful. Wonder, love them to bits. And the 11th edition here, uh, a copyright 1911, but uh, the copy I have is 1910. And then you have the 12th edition, 13th edition, and 14th edition, which I have a set of. And a couple of things that are peculiar about the 14th edition, it lists every year, every year that the 14th edition is published, but it misses 1931, 34, and 35. Every other year is covered, and I don't know why. I don't know why. The 14th edition certainly did last what almost uh, almost 50 years and that is truly amazing for Britannica and in the 15th edition takes over in 1974 and goes up to 1990 now the problem is for me is that the Britannica as good as it is is not going to be published uh, after 2012 there were no more editions, there were no more printings. So 20 years from now, all anyone will ever know for history or science is what's on the internet. There's not going to be any books anymore. All these editions will be swept asunder and the ones remaining will be declared obsolete. Oh, it's, oh that information is old information. We've remodernized now. Now we know the truth. And the new information will update all of this old and inaccurate information and that's what they'll say if you can get your hands on on uh, 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 some of these uh, encyclopedia sets from Botanica and you don't want your children to be stupid have them do their research out of Britannica instead of online and that way not only will their papers be more original they will be more accurate and the teachers won't even have a clue what the what what the kids are talking about the would they but this is a problem and this is eulogy for an old friend goodbye Britannicas